Likute Sichais, Chelik Tezva, Volume 15, the first Sicha for Parshas Vayeshev. As an introduction, just to help us move along better throughout the Sicha, I uh, just want to take us back quickly to two weeks ago, Parshas Tolois. If you recall, when Rivka was pregnant with the twins and she was uh, bewildered by the movement that was going on inside of her, and she came to the prophet. And what did the prophet tell her? He said that there are two nations in your womb. And he concludes with Verav Yavoid Sawyer. And the older one, the greater one, will serve. He shall serve the younger one. Okay, that is the ultimate of the pro- the ultimate purpose of it all. That's the kind of the sum total of it all. And it's interesting that from this it comes out that Rav, who is the older one, we know that Esav was born first. So Esav is indeed the older one, but he's also referring to him as the greater one. How is it that Esav is greater than Yaakov? How is this possible? Well, the answer is, we know this Kabbalistically and according to Chassidus, and we actually touched upon it a few weeks ago in that very Sicha, on that very Parsha, that the Shoresh, the root of Esav, a the source of, in, in Kedusha, in the upper worlds of Esau, is actually from a much higher place than that of Yaakov. In the way it's described in Kabbalah, Esau comes from Olam Hatohu, or it's known in English as the world of chaos. Okay, It's chaotic because it's so much uh, and so great in, 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 in an infinite amount of light, of godly energy, that it doesn't have any room to be contained. And therefore, it's just like there was a shattering, so to speak, of the vessels that were meant to contain them, but they could not contain them. Thus, the sparks of holiness fell and became embedded in different places in the world, even and especially in the places of impurity, in points that are not consistent with Kedusha, with holiness. Yaakov, however, is from the Olam HaTikun. Okay, the world that's a correct world, meaning everything is proper. Yes, there are less uh, and more finite sources of godly energy, but to accommodate them, you have the proper amount and the proper sizing of, quote, vessels, spiritual vessels, in order to be able to channel them properly without the chaotic effect that we have from Olam HaTohu. So in short, Olam HaTohu is greater, and thus Esav is referred to as the Rav, the greater one, the older one, whereas Yaakov is considered the Tzayr, the younger one, or somewhat less great compared to Esav. Another thing I want to touch upon is in last week's Parsha, in two weeks ago's Parsha, in Parsha's Vayetze, I, I'm, forgive me, last week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayishlach, where Yaakov finally meets up with Esav. And Esav says to him, brother, come along with me. And Yaakov says, no, 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 no. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. You go ahead. Ad asher avo el adoni seira. Until I come to my master to Seir. Seir is Mount Seir. That is the place. That is the settlement of Esau. That represents the ideals of Esau. That represents the whole concept of Esau. Now, of course, we know, as Rashi tells us, Yaakov had no intention of coming there. So did Yaakov lie? No, he did not lie. In fact, what Yaakov was referring to, and Rashi says it very clearly, he was referring to the very distant future, in the, from Yaakov's times, that is, that the time of Mashiach will come. As it says in the prophet Ovadia, which incidentally, the prophet Ovadia is a descendant of Esau. Okay, of course, through means of conversion, he became a Jew and became a prophet. He was from a family of converts, but a direct descendant of Esau. In any case, he says over there a verse that we're very familiar with. It says, That the judges of Mount Sinai, the, I'm sorry, the deliverers will go up to Mount to Mount Zion, to, to, to Har Tzion, which is Yerushalayim, and they will judge Mount Seir, the, the mountain of Esav, and then, and then kingship will be to Hashem. So we see that one of the ultimate points of the coming of the Mashiach is the judgment of Mount Esau. Of course, it doesn't mean to judge them, to punish them necessarily. What it means is actually, what we'll learn throughout the Sikha, is to extract Esau and the good that's in Esau and bring it to its proper place, to its elevated place, and to its therefore useful, purposeful place. 
So let's go into the parsha. At the end of last week's parsha, I mean, let's go into the sicha that is. At the end of last week's parsha, it describes over so many verses, it describes the generations, the descendants of Esau, and all their yishuvim, all their settlements, meaning all their, you know, their whole entire settlement, how they evolved as a nation, and all the places they settled, and so on, all the way, it kind of goes fast forward, all the way until the time of the very first king of the Jews was appointed, coronated, and that is King Shaul, Shaul HaMelech which happens way after the Jews enter Israel, after a whole period of time that there were judges and the prophets that ruled the Jews, and only then did Shmuel Hanavi, Prophet Samuel, establish the first kingship in Israel. So, only after that does our parsha come in to the picture, and in our parsha it begins to describe the Yishuve Yaakov, all the settlements of Yaakov, everything that happened in Yaakov's lives and his children's life. And from here to the end of the Torah, practically speaking, it's going to be talking about only us, the Jewish people, our nation. So the sages say about this, they give a parable for this. What is the parable? They say that uh, a king who had lost a jewel in the sand, in the Afar, and... There's sand there, and there are pebbles there. And now he has a need to look through the sand. In other words, the sand becomes now important. The pebbles become now important, because he knows that the jewel is somewhere there. And what does he do? He starts to go through it. But then when he reaches the jewel, he leaves, it says, he leaves the sand. He lets go of the sand and all the, all the pebbles, and he deals with the jewel. So likewise, over here, he was dealing with all the sand and the pebbles, so to speak. Namely, the, the tribes of Esau, the descendants of Esau, which are likened to like the dirt. And finally, when he finds, when he focuses onto the jewel, that's this week's Parsha, he leaves it all. And this perhaps is what the sages are saying. He's trying to explain why we dealt with it very quickly, zoomed all the way far out ahead, to, to, to cover all of the tribes of Esau so we can let go of it and focus in only on Yaakov and his descendants. And then the Chazal, the sages tell us also that likewise we find, or similarly we find, when it comes to the ten generations from Avraham, I mean from Adam, Adam to Noah, and then later from Avraham to, I mean from Noah to Avraham. Again, from no Adam to Noah and from Noah to Avraham, where you see that there's a focus on Adam, and then it kind of fast forwards, it goes through very quickly, just naming them, but without any emphasis, without any elaboration, it goes straight to Noah and then it takes a pause, it stops, and it deals with Noah and tells us about Noah's life and things that happened in his life, and then again it zooms up, speeds up, and it goes all the way to Avraham. Again, similar in this vein that. There wasn't really much to talk about them. They're not the focus. They're like the dirt that you have to kind of go through it, get it over with. Now, it's interesting that Rashi also similarly brings this um, mashal with slight changes, as we'll discuss later. But, of course, here comes the questions. Number one, why didn't the sages bring this parable immediately when the Torah spoke about Noah? In other words, this should be cause for explanation already back then. Why does the Medrash wait only here? When we come to Parshat Vayeshev, where we're starting to deal with and discuss the details of Yaakov and his descendant's life, then the, the sages bring this mashal. Why not this parable? Why not back then? In other words, why, did, why, why is it, it seem that it's more apropos for our topic here, namely Yaakov versus Esav, more than they're just there. That's just kind of like, by the way, they say similarly it happened with Avraham and it happened with Noah. Another very interesting question. If you think about it, Noah did not live in those 10 generations. In other words, Noah was the 10th generation. So there's a need to cut through all those 10 generations because chronologically you have to go from generation 1 to generation 2 to generation 3 in order to get to 10. And it's understood how, why they sped through, the Torah speeds through all those generations and mentions them only to get to Noah. 
But here it doesn't seem to fit in exactly this parable. You see, because Yaakov is here. Yaakov is a son of Yitzchak. Yaakov is present. So what do we need to search for amongst Esau? What do we need to go through? What do we need to cut through Esau and his descendants when Yaakov is here? Yaakov is his presence. So just start talking about Yaakov. Why is it important to, to talk about Esau? Start right here and right now. So why, 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 why does the Torah have to go through it? And especially that we're going through generations that are far out ahead, that are not even present right now. They're not here. They're not current. So if we're going to talk about Yaakov, just talk about Yaakov. I'll go through it. There's some that want to explain that there is a connection. Because what the Torah is trying to hint, this is actually the Maharal of Prague, that since it the, 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 the settlement of Yaakov, depended on of being settled in Seir, then only could Yaakov begin to settle and to go into the land of Israel, therefore the Torah mentions it. So he says, the Rebbe says, that's an interesting answer, an interesting perspective, however, it's not comprehensive enough to really answer this question. Why? Because the parable doesn't seem to fit in then. Because what you're saying is that when he settled, when Esau settled, now Yaakov can settle. But that doesn't explain, that doesn't account for the parable where you, that kind of was mixed in. Because in the parable, a very focal point, a very integral point of the parable is that the margalit, that the jewel, is embedded somewhere in the, in the, in the sand, in the, in, amongst the pebbles. It's there and you have to sift through it. This would just say that it's parallel. When that happens, this happens. But there isn't a direct connection. Also, a couple of things we need to understand Remember that whenever the Torah, and in this case the sages, which is part of the Torah, gives us a parable, every detail is important, every detail is crucial, and adds to the meaning. Sometimes it's not immediately obvious, we have to dig a little bit, but we, when we do, we come to appreciate why the sages chose uh, the, the various details, which they cho- why, why they chose the details they chose. So for example, the first thing is, which is very curious, why the two examples of dirt... You know, that he had to search among the dirt and pebbles. Why wouldn't just be enough? It would just say he had to search amongst the, the dirt, amongst the dirt for the, for to find the jewel. And also, why is it important? Why in the parable does it say, state the obvious? It states the obvious, which is superfluous. Because it says when he finds the jewel, then he leaves, then he puts down the sand and the, and the, and the pebbles and deals with the jewel alone. I mean, that seems to be very obvious. You, there's no need to explain it to us. We're not speaking to stupid people. And it's obvious that the whole point, the whole reason why I was holding, why the king was searching through the sand and the pebbles in the first place was to find the jewel. So it's quite clear and obvious that once he finds the jewel, he just lets go of the sand. He has no purpose for it anymore. This, perhaps, hints or points to the fact that there is another action here that is still playing a role, meaning that is still crucial to the entire picture, meaning the putting down, the, 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 the letting go of the sand and the, and the, and the, and the, um, and the pebbles is not just a default action, but it seems to be an active, it plays an active role here in the entire thing, as we'll soon see. Another thing, and this already will focus on Rashi. Remember, you recall I said Rashi also brings this parable, however, with some slight changes. When Rashi talks about searching through the sand and the pebbles, Rashi also uses the expression vikovro bikvara, which means he sifts it through in a sieve. Why does Rashi have to say it? Why is it important to say you're sifting through in a sieve? Why is it not enough to just say you're just searching through the sand? Why does Rashi add that? And we know, again, Rashi, everything he adds, every, every, every extra word, every nuance, obviously is hinting to something. And another thing, when it comes to finding the jewel, Rashi deviates slightly from the verbiage of the sages in their parable, even though he's quoting the Midrash. And he says, quote, and he throws away the pebbles. He doesn't mention anything about putting down the sand or anything. It just says he discards the, ter- the pebbles. So we need to understand really what's going on over here. The explanation of this is as follows. We need to understand that the purpose, we have to get the true perspective of what the purpose of, quote, the settlements of Yaakov, the story of Yaakov and his children, which is 
the story of us, our people, what is really the whole purpose? It's not just about settling in a land and living in the land of Israel. It's not just about that. But rather, as Yaakov himself said to Esau, if you recall in the introduction, that, quote, until I come to Mount Seir, and meaning the end of time, the purpose of it all is the time of Mashiach, when the when the redeemers will go up to judge Mount Mount Seir, meaning to come and elevate everything and bring everything to its proper place, to where it really belongs, and then it will truly and absolutely function in the greatest way that it was meant to function. In other words, that is the purpose of it all, and that purpose actually begins right here in this parsha. In this parsha, we begin to talk about Yaakov and his children, his descendants, and how everything evolved, how they ended up in Egypt, and Egypt leads to the giving of the Torah, which is the beginning, real, the real beginning of, <clears throat> the, the full beginning of the process of preparing the world for Mashiach, of bringing and leading to that point when we're going to, quote, judge Mount Seir, going to elevate even Esau. And this is what, the sages were referring to. This is their intention in the, in the um, parable that they bring. That the whole purpose is that it begins now and it's going to end in the time of Mashiach. When? When it'll come to Sayer. When I'm going to quote, I'm going to come to my master and Sayer. That the whole purpose, the whole fulfillment of Yaakov depends on all these settlements of Esau. Meaning it depends on Esav. It's not just Esav happens to be there or is serving as a nuisance. No, with Esav and through Esav will come the ultimate elevation of the world, thus the ultimate fulfillment of the purpose of Yaakov and his sons, that is us, because it's all hidden in Esav. What is that? And of course, this helps us understand and now makes sense why the Torah spells out, why the Torah lists all the descendants of Esau up until that point of King Shaul, of Shaul HaMelech. You see, Shaul HaMelech is referred to as Mashiach Hashem. He was anointed by the prophet as being the anointed of Hashem, the anointed of God. And the sages tell us that had we merited then, had we not caused things to go, uh, so to speak, off plan, plan A was that Shaul would be the first king and then the ultimate king which is the King Mashiach. So it enumerates it all the way to the time when it was the first opportunity, real-time opportunity for the coming of Mashiach, for the effect of Mashiach, thus the effect of the whole elevation of Esau. And now we can understand why we bring these two examples in the parable of dust, of sand, and of, and, and, um, and of um, pebbles. You see... When it comes to, quote, elevating the bad, elevating the world, in this case, elevating Esau, which is the greatest symbol of elevating the sparks of holiness, there's really, there's two aspects to it. There is the part of the world, the part of the material world, the part of the world which may seem on the surface to be not conducive for Torah, not so holy, not so good, but yet there are very good aspects to it, and there's definitely a lot of good embedded in it. So it's like the sand. We need to elevate it. We need to bring it out, bring out the good that's in there. Sand in itself does serve as a cover, as an obscurity. It covers up on things. Something falls in there and it gets hidden. It gets lost. This light, it's, this, it's, light, it's like the idea of the world. It covers up on godliness. It doesn't allow us to see the good that's there. It makes it look like the world is only about indulgence and materialism. It's not. There's a lot of good in there. We can elevate it. That is the aspect of sand, because sand in itself, it also has very good purposes. It doesn't just serve as a nuisance. However, when it comes to, for example, the pebbles, there, as we always find consistently in the Talmud, the pebbles are always used as a symbol of a dover hamazik, something that causes harm. We even know that even one of the... One of the um, um, uh, classical uh, sources, so to speak, uh, roots of, of, of damages in the Talmud is described, uh, described as tsroros, as having something that was done by pebbles. Pebbles, they, you throw a pebble, you hurt someone, it breaks things, it breaks glass, and so on. 
Thus, when it comes to, el this is the other element of elevation. So that when it comes to elevating the world, there is part of the world, there is part of that bad, that's inherent bad, and that cannot be elevated. Now we can appreciate and understand this expression why he says he discards, discarding the pebbles. Because when Mashiach comes, we can understand what Rashi was saying. When Mashiach comes, we find in the prophecies that there will be some of the nations that will be judged and will be totally, they will be punished and totally eradicated, annihilated. Hashem says he'll do away with them. Those are symbolic of the, of the uh, pebbles that you cannot elevate. There's no good, there's no, there's no good qualities in them. There's no redeeming qualities that could be redeemed. However, there are nations in the world on which the prophets give us the prophecy who says, which say, Ve'amdu zarim vero tzano. So, you know, and strangers means foreigners, meaning the Gentiles will stand up and serve as shepherds for the sheep, meaning they'll serve as servants. They will serve as a purposeful, meaningful, good use for the Jewish people and therefore for Kedusha, for holiness. And that is symbolic of the offer of the sand, which has some good, it has good purposes when it's directed in the right purposeful way. So Yaakov reaches and fulfills his true purpose, Dafka, specifically through the Rav Yavot Sawyer, that the greater one, the older one, the one that comes from a higher source, as we explained in the introduction, when he's able to take that, the, 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 take that and elevate it, then not only does it bring purpose to Esau, not only does it bring purpose to the world, it brings purpose to Yaakov. In other words, Yaakov cannot get, could not reach his and fulfill his purpose. In other words, cannot meaningfully justify being here and accomplishing what he has to accomplish without Esau. In other words, without that sand and without those those pebbles, or specifically without the sand, without the dirt, that initially seems to cover things up. But when you work with it, when you when you go through it, you find the jewels, the sparks, the holiness. You find the good. Without that, Yaakov would never reach his purpose. And therefore, Yaakov needs Esau. And therefore, the Torah has to describe the all the generations of Esau, all the way until the first, very first opportunity of Mashiach, which was with Shaul HaMelech, with King Saul. To give you an example of this, we, we, we encounter this, we experience this on a daily basis. We know that the world has basically four elements, four tiers. You have the domain, the inanimate. You have Tzomeach, which is higher, which is the plant life. Then you have the Chai, which is the animal life. And animal kingdom, and then you have the medaber, you have the human being. What does the human being sustain himself on? By eating chai, right, from living things, meat, fish, by sustaining himself on vegetables or all kinds of vegetation, the plant life. And where does that all come from? From the domain, from the inanimate. And the question is, why is it that the highest of all beings is dependent on the lowest? And the answer, the explanation that's explained in Kabbalah is, although they seem lower, and although they're down here, in a, their manifestation is in a lower manner than the human being, but, tru, but, but the truth is that in their source, they come from a much higher place even than the human being. And therefore, they could sustain the human being. Therefore, they can give nutrients to the human being. But since they've fallen so low, it's the human being that needs to make use of them to elevate them and bring them up to a higher place. So this helps us understand very clearly why we needed to go through and talk about Esau. What is the lesson for us in the time of Golos, especially in this last Golos, which is called Golos Edom, the Golos of Edom, which is from Rome, which is a direct descendant of Esau, that one has to understand that we're here to elevate the sparks of holiness. We're here that to elevate those things that although they seem lower than us, but really, those parts of the world and those sparks of holiness that are embedded in different places in the world, wherever a Jew finds him or herself, is actually, they're actually higher than our soul. And through elevating them and bringing back, them back to their source, we become fulfilled. It's not just like we're doing it for the world. We're doing it for ourselves. This becomes the completion of the purpose of, of, our, of our souls. And now we can understand the various details here. Why a jewel? Because it's the sparks of holiness. Why 
dirt because material things in themselves seem to obscure godliness, seem to uh, uh, cover up unholiness. But when you dig with it, when you work with it, you could actually find the good that's in there. And of course, the, the pebbles, as we mentioned, because there is no redeeming quality in them, they're only something that serves as a, as a source of damaging other things, of hurting other things, and therefore those are the things that get totally discarded. But one needs to understand now why does Rashi, why does the Medjur say you put down the sand? Because it's true that we're working with the sand, meaning with the material of the world, in order to elevate the sparks of holiness that are in there, to bring them out and to bring them back to their source. But the attitude that one needs to have in order to be able to effectively do this is one has to, quote, put down, place down. One has to realize that the material in itself doesn't, shouldn't play a big role in their life. We don't live for it. We live for using it for the real purpose that we live for. And now we can understand why this was discussed specifically by Yaakov. You see, because whereas Noah and Avraham play a role in preparing the world so that Yaakov can step in and begin the process in a real manner, but their effect was limited without getting into the details of why, but their effect was limited. The true beginning, the real absolute beginning of this process of preparing the world and bringing it to its ultimate place, it begins with Yaakov, and specifically in this Parsha, because this begins the story of Yosef when he ends up in Egypt, and from Egypt they will come, that will be the direct preparation, the, the, the preparation for receiving the Torah, which is the manual, and makes it possible for us to truly prepare the world for Mashiach to the time that we're going to fully and absolutely elevate um, elevate the uh, the world and elevate Esau himself.